to the altar. Are you hurting and broken within? Overwhelmed by the weight of your sin? Jesus is calling. Have you come to the end of yourself? Do you thirst for a drink from the well? Jesus is calling. sorrows and trade them for joy from the ashes a new life is born Jesus is calling oh come to the altar the Father's arms are open wide forgiveness was born with
Today is what we call Youth Sunday, so we have um, some of our youth helping out in diff different areas of the service this morning, so um, we're excited about that. Make sure you show your appreciation to them for their service this morning. We want to focus this morning um, just on worshiping God. He is a great God. Um, we've got a lot of songs that um, just sing out and, and praise him this morning because he is worthy. We're going to sing Death Was Arrested. redeemed only beauty remains my orphan heart was given a name my morning grew quiet my feet rose to dance when death was arrested and my life began oh your grace oh
may be seated now if you want to. I couldn't have you sit for that song. We're going to continue in worship. Continue to sing about that freedom we have, no longer slaves. good to have all of you here. Um, it's been a, a, a little bit of a, an unusual week in uh, all the new unusual ways, but we also had the opportunity uh, to minister to the family of one of the former pastors, and I would thank you, Card, here. To all of our friends and family at FLBC, thank you. It's so hard to express how much it means to us to be able to just ask for your help and know you would be there. Thank you for your love, your prayers, the cards, plants, and food for my brother's family. He loved you all so very much and was so proud of our church. The kids 
have such wonderful memories in so many of, of so many of you. Uh, my brother will be missed so much, but we are so thankful for your, his teaching, his encouragement, his example, and his love. Looking forward to seeing him again. Love Dave and Kathy Mostrom. And uh, got to talk with the, uh, his children when they were here and his wife uh, Thursday. And uh, they wanted, each of them said, to express to you their appreciation uh, for all that the church did for them in opening up the building and providing the meal. I want to thank the ladies uh, who worked so hard in the kitchen, Pastor Timothy, uh, for helping get uh, things done. And uh, for those of you who helped set up Wednesday night and, and clean up things on Thursday from the youth group. It's really youth week. They've been, uh, they've been on more than one time this week and appreciate all that they've done here. Um, as far as announcements of things coming up, I hope that you get a bulletin today and look uh, at the things that are coming. Um, we're adding to the 13th, besides the kickoff for our clubs, um, which start that, that evening. Um, the youth group has a kickoff activity uh, that was uh, scheduled for that night. That's still on. But at 3 o'clock, the start of their time at the lake anyway, um, we're going to have a baptism service. Uh, we have several people being baptized. If you have not been baptized since placing your faith in Jesus Christ, uh, the scriptures say that Jesus said to go make disciples and baptize them. And so we can't do our part if you don't do your part. Um, so it's, uh, it's that time. Uh, if you've not been baptized since your uh, faith was put in Jesus Christ as your Savior, uh, come talk to me. We'd like to include you in that baptism service. This will probably be our last opportunity of the year to do the outdoor baptism at the lake. Um, uh, you know, traditionally that would have been the kickoff of fair week and things, and it would not have been the same kind of an experience <laughs> to uh, to try to fit anything into that day when we had the fair ministry and all the things that are normal to us. But it's not it's not normal, okay? Uh, normal is to meet a particular norm, and we don't even have one of those. So um, it is what it is, and really looking forward to it and excited to talk to the people that I have so far about baptism, but if you haven't been baptized, I um, would like you to talk to me, and you've got a couple weeks to do that. Uh, next week is Labor Day weekend. You didn't know that. I just want to throw that out there. Um, uh, we do have a group going camping again this year. It's a little unusual in the, with all the restrictions and the other things. The group's not the group. There's not all the group grouping, but it's camping, and you're outside, and you can, it'll be all right. Well, We'll be fine. And this year we don't have to keep walking past the area that's in the group campground because we couldn't get it because the group campground got washed in the lake. And so uh, it's, um, it'll look different, it'll feel different for those who are there, but uh, for those of you who aren't there, and if you have uh, family and friends visiting you because uh, this is a nice place to be too, um, uh, we'll have morning services here uh, next week uh, at the regular times, but no evening service uh, next week. And uh, so uh, tonight is the last night of our uh, seminar on stewardship here. And so I invite you to come back at 6 o'clock tonight for that. But uh, next weekend is, is Labor Day weekend. And have a great time. Uh, but we'll have our regular services here. And uh, I'll be back uh, for that uh, service. Um, some of you have already asked me, so I'll just tell those of you who didn't care. Um, I'll be back. Uh, won't be with a camping group for Sunday morning, but um, we'll be here. So. Um, let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your love, your faithfulness, and would ask that you would speak to our hearts during this time. Uh, Father, normally we use this time to give back a portion of what you bless us with. Father, we're so thankful for those who faithfully continue to give to the work of the ministry. Uh, their faithfulness allows us to continue, uh, but it's your faithfulness to them that allows us to be here, to know you, to worship before you, um, Father, we're um, looking forward to uh, the holiday when we celebrate the, the privilege of work. We've been reminded in the last few months that that's really what it is in our economy, a, a privilege and a, an opportunity for us to be good stewards and to um, participate in the work that you've given us to do. And uh, Father, we just pray for those who are still without work, those whose businesses aren't allowed to be open, the, the struggles that are going on around us. We can't really be thankful unless we're also praying for the needs of others. And, Father, we're uh, praying for our country, for our leaders, for those things. But uh, we are hopeful, even as we see our young people today, uh, a part of our service. Uh, this is your church. These are your people. And uh, 
They come in all ages, shapes, and sizes, and not just here, but around the world. And we just pray that you bless today as they worship in Jesus' name. As we were practicing this morning, <clears throat> all of these songs talk about how that God chose to save us. He chose to send his son. He chose to um, give his life so that we could go to heaven and be with him. Our next song is called Who You Say I Am. And many people have wondered how um, as a younger sister, I could handle the fact that my older brother, who was perfectly healthy, was chosen to um, have COVID. And to be honest, we were actually a little more concerned about his wife, who has some heart problems. But um, as we were interacting with him, the day before he went into the hospital, I said to him, how are you doing? And he said, Kathy, it's probably the worst I've ever felt in my life, but I know God will get me through it. And 24 hours later, he was in the hospital. Two weeks later, he died. Dave loved this church. He was very young when he came. And he, his children were born here. And the legacy that he left started here. He chose at a very young age to give his heart to the Lord, to be an example to so many people of what God's love is all about. I don't know if you've seen the movie, um, I can't even think of the name, but there's a song, this song is in the movie, and it's about a young girl who um, gave her life to the Lord. And um, her teacher told her to look through Ephesians and to write down all of the qualities, all the things that God had given her because now she was his child. And as she wrote them down, they're singing this song. And then she stands on a, a mountain or a hill or something overlooking a lake and just puts her arms out while they're singing, I am a child of God. Dave is in heaven singing that today. He was welcomed with open arms. And his message to you would be, you don't know when, what tomorrow holds, 
we had no reason to think that he would be the one chosen to go. But he was ready. So I hope as you sing this song that you can honestly say, I am a child of God. And what that means is, have you accepted him? Have you believed that he died <coughs> and rose again for you? Because on our own, we can't do it. We had to have God, we had to have Christ come and take our place. And now we're given that chance to believe in him and to give our lives totally to him, to be used by him. So as you're th singing this, really make sure in your heart, am I a child of God? Can I honestly say this? Will I be welcomed with open arms in heaven when I pass? I praise God that my brother was. Thank you. Amen. Please stand with us as Jessica leads us. Who you say?
You may be seated. For this time, in honor of Youth Sunday, I'm going to ask that all the youth and youth leaders to come up front for special music. And continuing on for Youth Sunday, we have Drew here who's going to read some scripture for us. Take it away. I will be reading uh, Ephesians 1. Blessed be the God and the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual being in heavenly places, even as he would choose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and blameless before him. In love, he predestined us for us to adoption to himself as sons through Jesus Christ, according to the purpose of his will to the praise of his glorious grace with which he has blessed us in the beloved. In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses according to the riches of his grace which he lavished upon us in all of his wisdom and insight making known to us the mystery of his will according to his purpose which he set forth in Christ as a plan to the fullness of time to unite all things to him, things in heaven and things on earth. In him we have attained an inheritance, having been predestined according to the purpose of him who works all things according to the counsel of his will, so that we who were the first to hope in Christ might be able to praise of his glory. In him you also, when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of the salvation, believed in him, were sealed with the promise of the Holy Spirit, 
who is the guarantee of our inheritance until we acquire possession of it to the praise of his glory. I want to say thank you to all the young people for their participation in our service this morning. They always participate, but not always on the platform. And if you haven't been on the platform, it's a little different up here. So uh, turn your Bibles to Romans chapter 10. Continuing our series in Romans, and uh, we'll remind you if you were here last week, and we'll inform you if you missed it and didn't catch it on uh, line. I guess uh, rather than the scramble to get things up as soon as possible, if you are here, you're probably not following the online presentation, but some people are still not attending uh, with the situation the way it is, and so uh, we still have an online broadcast of the service, but we're a week behind. If you really like this week's sermon, you can listen to it next Sunday. Um, but uh, uh, it's, a, it's that kind of a, a process, and so uh, we, um, it allows us to do a, a better job with the editing and things without the, the crisis management feeling uh, that we were doing before. And so um, as we look in Romans chapter 10, we uh, are going to look at the first uh, portion of it, and uh, then just a few verses next week. But uh, if you remember the discussion from chapter 9, Paul is laying out for the Roman church, and he's writing to Christians, and he's explaining to them the doctrine behind what they have their faith and trust in. And one of the exciting parts about Christianity is we receive Jesus Christ with the faith of a child. And you don't have to explain every detail to a child for them to believe you when you're telling them the truth. They, they want to believe, and they are desiring to know the truth and uh, but as you grow the Bible says you're supposed to understand more and one of the reasons we have doctrinal sections laid out for us Paul's been grinding through in the first eight chapters the doctrine of the scriptures in salvation is so that we can grow milk belongs to babes and meat to those who grow and uh, I still enjoy a glass of milk every so often but I'd I am looking forward to meat for lunch. Um, we, we develop a taste for what we can handle and consume. And if people don't grow, we consider that a tragedy. If they don't grow spiritually, we almost consider that normal. That's just, you know, yeah, they've got, as long as they're saved. Now, is it important for people to be saved? Absolutely. Positively. It is also important for us to understand and grow. And so in the Roman church, there are beginning to be divisions because we have a bunch of young Christians who are together. And some of them are from a Jewish background. Some of them are from a Gentile background. And some of them have been involved in idolatry. And some of them are, um, quite frankly, tied more to their Roman culture than to Christianity. And some of them are tied more to their Judaism than to their newfound faith in Christ. And Paul says, hey, this isn't going to work unless you get it, that the most important thing is your salvation. The most important thing is what you have in Jesus Christ. Nothing from Judaism remains unchanged by Jesus Christ. And nothing about the Roman culture remains unchanged if you know Jesus Christ. We are now living here under these circumstances, but we do not do anything the way everybody else does it if they're not a Christian. You understand that? Even what we've done as a funeral this week, the Bible says we don't mourn as those who have no hope. We mourn. We're not cold-hearted. It's not that we don't care. It's that we have something that other people don't have, and it makes a difference every single day. And so when we get to chapter 10, Paul says, has finished chapter 9 with saying, look, whoever you are, wherever you're from, if you put your faith in Jesus Christ, you will not be ashamed. He is what you need. And so he starts chapter 10 with an interesting statement. And uh, we're going to look at that down through verse 10 this morning. Follow along as I read. Brethren, my heart's desire and my prayer to God for Israel is that they may be saved. For I bear them witness that they have a zeal for God, 
but not according to knowledge. For they, being ignorant of God's righteousness and seeking to establish their own righteousness, have not submitted to the righteousness of God. For Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone who believes. For Moses writes about the righteousness which is of the law. The man who does those things shall live by them. But the righteousness of faith speaks in this way. Do not say in your heart who will ascend into heaven. That is to bring Christ down from above. Or who will ascend into the abyss. That is to bring Christ up from the dead. But what does it say? The word is near you, even in your mouth and in your heart. That is the word of faith which I preach that if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart one believes into righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your love for us. We thank you for your word. And it is as the word speaks that we want to focus on. We may all come from different backgrounds and ideas about what it means to follow Christ. The scriptures are our final authority for all matters of faith and practice. Some of us have the opportunity to have more knowledge and more training and more understanding of the things that God expects. We are no more saved than a child who simply puts their faith and trust in who Jesus is and what Jesus has done for them. The good news is not that we are transformed beings by the blood of Jesus Christ and we get the opportunity to walk in obedience to a glorious God. The good news is that Christ, the Son of God, died for us, was buried and rose again that we might have new life. And Father, help us as we go through this passage to focus on Christ. Our heart's desire and prayer is that someone here without Christ would be saved. We'll give you the prayer, the praise, the glory, the love that is due. In Jesus' name, amen. We're here worshiping on a Sunday because we have a level of zeal for church going. <laughs> it's, a, it's a thing. Right now there are places in the country where they're still being literally forbidden to gather as churches. Even though a good thing is that the courts have begun to rule in favor of uh, churches at least being treated as fairly as strip clubs. Um, so there's that. Um, we ought to have a commitment to the concept of worshiping God wherever, whenever, however we're able, let alone allowed. And we ought to have a zeal, a desire, a burden to, to gather in worship. Uh, sometimes it seems more like you're, you have to kind of be drawn, but um, uh, you're here today because you had enough desire to overcome your mattress beat that thing down and say, no, you will not win today. I will get up and I will go forth and I will get dressed. And you overcame the closet and picking out what to wear. And you, you said, I have enough zeal, enough burden to be at church to get there. That's fantastic. But it, I hope you realize being in church doesn't make you a Christian. I remember I was in college the first time I heard that being in church doesn't make you a Christian any more than being in a garage makes you a car. I was like, nobody ever, I can't believe I've been in church my whole life and I never heard that. That's good. Um, uh, I had just become a Christian and I had been in church literally my whole life. My parents told me they brought me to church the first Sunday after I was born. And my dad was a school principal. You did what you were told. So I was in church every Sunday after that. Yeah. In our family, you proved you were sick or you were, you were in school and you were in church. Um, you don't want to know how we had to prove we were sick. But um, 
uh, we're reminding you, if you don't feel well, stay home. But other than that, you should be here. But that's not what it means to be a Christian. Christianity is based on our personal relationship with Jesus Christ. And as Paul said, for his people, I say for my people, my heart's desire and prayer to God for Fish Lake is that you may be saved. I don't want you to think, and I don't want to think that everybody who shows up is a Christian or they wouldn't bother. There are people who come who may not know Christ as Savior. There are people who are here and may know Christ as Savior but are not focused on that relationship in a biblical way. And that's what Paul's addressing here as he addresses the church. He says, my heart's desire is for Israel. And that's really interesting because Paul's mission from God was to be the apostle to the Gentiles. But if you read through the book of Acts, when Paul goes to a new town, he goes to the Jewish synagogue. And he says, I need to tell you about Jesus Christ. And lots of times that doesn't go really well. Because the Jews are not lacking zeal for God. What did he say? They have a zeal for God. Paul had a zeal for their salvation, so Paul kept going, and he kept going, and he kept praying, and he kept going. And you want to know what? That's fine. But Paul's burden for them didn't save them. And their zeal for God didn't save them. They had a zeal for God that was so strong that just like Paul, when he had a zeal for God, and he had never done anything to break the law, according to him, um, he went around killing Christians. He went around arresting Christians and bringing them to trial, <laughs> trying to get rid of them. That was very often his response to bringing the gospel to a new town. I'm going to find the Jews. I'm going to tell them about the Messiah who came for them. And their response is going to be, we love God way too much to love his son. What was the problem? They had a zeal for righteousness. The word righteousness means doing right. The problem was their definition of doing right was not according to knowledge. They had the wrong idea of right. When we read those verses in the Bible and we say people call good evil and evil good, we think about all the people who don't go to church all the irreligious people all over the world, people who have no zeal and love for God. No, sadly, if you look through history, some of the worst things are done by people who have a zeal for God, but not according to the truth. They go about to establish their own righteousness, their own idea of what is right. And in doing that, they reject the righteousness that is by faith in believing God. They don't need a Savior offered them in Scripture because they have a religion that they're happy with. Have you ever shared Jesus Christ with somebody and had them tell you that? No, nah, I, I don't need that. I may fill in the blank. No, no, I don't need that. I've already fill in the blank. If you go to different parts of the country, if you go to different parts of the world, and you share Jesus Christ, the God of heaven, who came and died for their sins, and rose again to give eternal life, people all over the world, not just Jews, but people all over the world, and people all over in American churches today say, that's nice, but I believe that what I have is good enough. I've told people that the Bible says that salvation is by faith and not by works. They say, well, that doesn't seem fair because that would mean that anybody could believe. And I'm a really good person and I should get to go. It's like, I don't, lots of times the people who tell me that are swearing when they say it. And I say, your definition of really good and God's may not be the same. Have you ever lied? Oh, yeah. 
do you know there's a command against that? Oh, yeah. You ever take anything that didn't belong to you? Well, I don't think so. Not even cookies that your mother hadn't given you because they're not yours unless you're given permission. Well, yeah, I mean, if you're going to get nitpicky, yeah, of course. Um, it's like, you're going to stand before God and go, well, yeah, I kind of, well, yeah, sort of, but swing to the New Testament to Jesus Christ who said, do you know the law? And the Jews, oh, yeah, we know the law. He said, you say that you should not commit adultery. Actually, God said that, but I say you should not look at a woman to lust after. Because you're committing adultery in your heart. And they said, now you're getting really nitpicky. Is one as bad as the other? Not, not to me it's not. And we all say regarding that, I'm not God, and we're all glad. God is holy. He has a different standard. And he gave the law to show people they were sinners. And specifically, the law was given to the Jews, and so they're really good at understanding the fact that they're sinners. But they're also good at taking the law and making everybody else obviously a sinner. And Gentiles especially, they don't even have the law, and they, they do all kinds of stuff that the Jews don't do. And Paul's saying, hey, look, you all have zeal for God, but unless it's according to knowledge, you're seeking the wrong righteousness. And the wrong righteousness is wrong. You don't get to define what is right. Only God does, because it's the righteousness of faith that brings salvation. And it's very important to Paul that the people he loves, his people, the Jews understand that they are not saved by keeping the law. They are not saved by keeping the law around the law. They are not saved by being Jewish. They're not. Those were all the doctrinal sections we went through, remember? This is this, and this is... And he's gotten them to this point and says, but my, my zeal is for the salvation of my people. I hope you have somebody you love enough to think of them always with a heart's burden and desire that they would be saved, so much that you would pray for that. But your prayers will not get them to heaven. Paul says, I've done everything I can do in every place that I've gone, and I still want to see them saved. One of the great things is it is never too late until someone is lost in a Christless eternity and you've got time to witness, you've got time to pray, you've got time to demonstrate the love of Christ. We ought to use that time. We ought to have zeal for what is right. In the Bible, what is right. We ought to have zeal for, as Christians for what is right. Because the Bible says, for you're saved by grace, through faith. That's not of yourselves. Not, it is the gift of God. And not of works, any works, at all. Salvation has nothing to do with any work. But we were created in Christ. Verse 10 is in the Ephesians. We were created in Christ to do good work. There's a whole bunch of things that are right to do as Christians. And coming to church is one of them. And you ought to have a zeal for coming to church. But coming to church won't make you more saved. Baptism is right. We have an opportunity for you, if you know Jesus Christ as Savior, to be obedient. How important is obedience to God? Okay, if you're going to say not very, you have a different view of God than I have. You have a different view of God than the Scripture has. Well, baptism isn't required to be saved. No, I don't believe it is, because I'm going to get to those verses, and it says, this is salvation. But you don't get to be saved and tell God you don't care what he thinks. You get to do whatever you want, because you're on your way to heaven. That's, the Bible says, is somebody who doesn't know him. Someone who professes without possessing. 
is somebody who says, I'm a believer, but I don't have to obey. The first part of this chapter talks about his zeal, but it says, our zeal is supposed to come according to knowledge. These things were written that you might know that you have eternal life. These things were written so that you might know how you ought to walk. These things are written so that you would understand, so that you could grow. These things aren't written to make us doubt whether we're saved. These things aren't written to make us wonder what's going on. These things are written so that we would be firmly built on the foundation of Jesus Christ. Paul finished by saying, Jesus is the cornerstone. Everything's built off of that. But a lot of people just trip over the stone. They, they're not interested in building off of it. It's in the way. If you don't know what it means to trip over something, I can demonstrate that for you quite regularly. I am, I am not the world's most graceful person. Uh, not, not at this church, but at my last few churches. It, I still have time, I guess. Uh, I have literally, and I think of it every time people come up the steps, I've literally done the face plant onto the platform in my previous ministries. You just got to get these big puppies to go up those in front of people or not. Catch that step, bam! Um, before I had knee surgery out in Pennsylvania, my knee occasionally would lock in this position. A little cartilage in the wrong place. So I would come up the step and I'd go to the next step and when I went to put weight on it, it would just stay there. And you really can't put weight on a knee that's bent like that just in case you go home and try it. Don't do it here. We have concrete floors. Find something soft. Bend your knee and put your weight down. It just keeps bending. And you will fall over. It's, it's, a, it's a thing. Why? Because it's not the way it's supposed to be. And yet I know people who profess Christianity, but not the way it's supposed to be. They've done something they think is going to be good enough. And just like the Jews, they, they not only don't except what God says, they say, I'm opposed to what God says. And so that leads us to the next section. It is about Christ. And so Paul begins to tell these Jews and Gentiles who don't always get along, unlike our church, where we always agree about everything, uh, they're, they're at it. And they take it so far as to say, if you disagree on this, you're not really saved. And they begin to say, who's going to heaven and who's not? The Judaizers are already at work in the ch church. Paul's not been personally to this church and doesn't know these people, but he's been to other places where he's established a church personally. And he writes letters to them and says, hey, who came in after I left and spoiled that place? By beginning to teach you that faith in Christ is not enough and you have to do this and you have to be Jewish and you have to start observing the law. Let me tell you about the law. Moses said that if you could keep the law, it would bring you life. And? Have you read the Old Testament? How many people, based on your understanding of the Old Testament, kept the law? Nada. That's why there's a sacrifice system established. And there's all that chopping and killing and burning and because they never kept it to get life. God knew they would never perfectly keep the law. And so he established a picture of the perfect sacrifice. And he said, if you do this sin, you do this. And that will show you and teach you forgiveness. That will teach you the atonement. That will teach you cleansing. That will teach you how to get right. That will teach you how to set things right, because if you steal, you do this. But it says, Moses said that, but the righteousness of faith speaks this way. It's by what you believe. That's what determines your salvation. Because Christ is the end of the law. Verse 4. For Christ is the end of the law. Well, if Paul really wanted to be clear about that, he would have said, 
what? Christ is the end of the law. We're not Jewish. We don't have a class here on law keeping. Is there anything wrong with the law? Don't lie, okay? It's not okay with God. Don't steal. Don't commit adultery. You get, you get the point? Don't chop up animals and burn them in your yard. Why? Because Christ fulfilled everything perfectly. He ended it by saying it was over. It is finished. And he ended it by fulfilling every detail of the sacrifices. By fulfilling every detail of the righteousness of God. What God said was right for salvation. Was the coming of the Messiah, the promised one. Our faith is in Christ. He is the Lord that we must confess in this passage. And the word here in the Greek is the word that was used in the Greek Old Testament to refer to the Messiah. We must confess the one that is exactly the Savior of Israel, the Savior of the Gentile, the Savior of the world. For God sent His beloved Son into the world, not to condemn it, but to save it. Christ is the one who judges salvation. The Bible says we will all stand before Him and give an account, and He will know His own. It is fantastic news to me to not have my salvation in the hands of others. If we had to take a vote on who gets to go to heaven, all the people who think this person did everything right and deserves to be in heaven. Occasionally people who aren't that smart tell me that I should run for some public office. I'm like, one, I have something I love doing, and being a politician is not on that list. Two, there are people who know me. And I have noticed that occasionally in political circles, people say nasty things. And I'm not so worried about the lies people would tell, I'm worried about the truth. Yeah. Um, the first time I was criticized in ministry, the pastor that I worked with, when I came in kind of overwhelmed with the fact that they were ripping me for something that I'd done, said, just be glad they don't know the truth about you. I was like, what? He said, there is none of us who do righteousness. No, not one. You're not worthy to be above criticism. You're not worthy to go to heaven. You're not worthy to be in the ministry. God chooses the foolish things of the world. That was the first time I really focused on what that verse meant. I'd made it all the way through Bible college and into ministry without anybody going, duh, he picked you because you ain't that good. I went, oh. The passage says, don't say that these people get to go to heaven and these people are going to the abyss. That is not your call. You're not Christ. You don't bring him down from glory or up from the res- you That's not your power. But what does it say? And he he quoted Moses before. He quotes Moses again. The word is near you, in your mouth and in your heart. It says, hey, it's a matter of belief and confession. Belief and confession, that's what it boils down to. The word of faith which we preach, if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart one believes unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made to salvation. What does the word say? That's what what Paul says. Look at what the word says. It's the word that we preach. 
It's the word that you've heard. You believe in your heart and you confess with your mouth. That's 1 Corinthians 15, the gospel in a nutshell, as people refer to it, say. If you believe in your heart, in the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ, and you confess the Lord, to confess means to say the same thing, or to tell the truth about something. So you confess in your heart the same thing that the Bible says about the Lord, Jesus Christ. He is God. He died in your place for your sin. He was buried and rose from the dead. And he is the only way of salvation. Well, what about if you're what about somebody who says they're a Christian and they, and they what? I don't see anything else in the definition of salvation. I see lots of stuff in growing in, in obedience. I see lots of stuff in here that I see lots of people sitting out there not doing. My heart's in desire and prayer to God for my church is that we would all grow and start obeying everything. But I'm way more worried about whether you're saved or not. And one of the things I think keeps some people from being obedient is the lack of salvation. But I'm not going to say whether you're saved or not. I told somebody that I'm not supposed to judge somebody's salvation. They said, where do you get that from the Bible? Here. Lots of other places. Nobody's going to stand before me and give an account. But the judgment seat, Christ isn't good. Hey, Pastor Tim, what do you think? They get enough stuff right to be here? What do we, what do we stand before God and find out? whether he looks at us and sees Jesus Christ and us in Christ because our faith is in Christ because we've received the gift that only Jesus Christ can give. And we can go, well, that's nice, but I'm, i got a checklist here of my righteousness. Paul said, Israel won't believe because of that. Don't bring that stuff to church. Should we do righteousness? Should it be our righteousness or the righteousness of faith which believes God? The righteousness of God. So salvation is the end of every salvation is the start of a new life in Christ. I'm not opposed to good works. I'm not opposed to any of the things you're supposed to do. I just want you to understand clearly, because it's sometimes not clear, that there isn't anything else attached to salvation. There are so many things that come from our salvation. So many things. And it starts with our obedience and our baptism and our fellowship with the body of Christ and our study of the word of God and our stopping sins that we know are wrong not by our own strength I had quit drinking and drugs and smoking and a bunch of other stuff lots of times before I was saved after I was saved by the grace of God through the word of God and the fellowship of the body of Christ, I actually stopped things. <laughs> I, I, I asked for help, and I, and, I, and I got some help I didn't ask for. I got confronted, and people said, you know, this really needs to change. I mentioned before with my temper, I, I got leveled and put in the hospital. 
And I was so angry, but with broken ribs, I couldn't really complain. As I lay there going, uh, uh, I thought, I shouldn't say that stuff anyway. God thinks this is a good idea, apparently. And I really need to stop getting so mad. It doesn't, I'd already had people point out the verses that say that the wrath of man does not accomplish the righteousness of God. And a whole bunch of, why did they share those verses with me? But I'm not going to heaven because I don't freak out and break things anymore. As it's been shared with me, you're all glad I don't. But, um, you know. A changed life is not what saves us. Salvation is what changes a life. If you've never experienced good legalism in church, where you're given a list of things Christians do in order to be right with God, and if you're doing them, you're good, I'm glad you've never gone through that. But if you profess to be a Christian and you're given a list of things in the Bible to do and you go, I don't have any interest in that, man, examine yourself whether you be found in the faith. But you're not going to stand before God and give an account of a checklist. For with the heart one believes unto righteousness, with the mouth confession is made to salvation. Salvation is by faith alone by grace alone. Let's pray. Dearly Father, I thank you for your word. I thank you for its truth. I just pray that you would speak to our hearts. If there's anyone here who has their faith in anything else but the finished work of Jesus Christ, if they're going to base their salvation on something they've done, then they have to have done everything perfectly. They're going to base their salvation on the finished work of Jesus Christ who came and dwelt among us and lived without sin in order that he might offer himself a perfect sacrifice without spot or blemish or any such thing that he would die on the cross and shed his blood. That he would declare that the, the separation from God that sin brings was accomplished in his work. When he cried out, my God, why have you forsaken? That the penalty for sin, which is death, was accomplished when he said it is finished and he gave up the ghost. That the promise of eternal life was fulfilled that glorious first Easter Sunday when the stone was rolled away and he was not there for he is risen as he said. Father, if there's anyone here who kind of thinks that's probably about right, but help them to receive the truth. May your spirit do the work that only it can do to bring them to understanding and to the knowledge of the truth. And we'll give you the praise and the glory for it in Jesus' name. Amen. If you're here today without Jesus Christ, love to take the Bible and show you further what it means to be in Christ. Have your faith and your trust in his finished work, and to be able to say, I've received the gift that only God can give, and only in his son, Jesus Christ. Don't leave today without him. As we sing, you can come forward and share that. If there's anything between your soul and the Savior, you know your faith is in Christ, but there's some areas of disobedience. There's some things that need to be right. The Bible says if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sin and to cleanse us. Those things need to be made right. It's not I'm going to heaven so it's okay to sin. That was Romans chapter 6, but it's still there. We did, we've moved on, but Romans 6 is still there. We confess our sin. We don't keep it as a pet. We identify it, call it what God calls it, and ask him to take it out of our lives.
Let's stand as we close. Follow on. about it and so that we are not the biggest group of liars that gather so far today um, instead we go out and we follow Jesus we do what he's called us to do announcement announcement yep you're not very she is so true about that she is not very loud I don't know what she sounds like when she yells at him at home but Around here, she's pretty quiet. I'm so. really quiet at home. <laughs> um, I just had an announcement for the Flourish Ladies Ministry. On September 24th is a Thursday at 6.30 p.m. We are having our gathering of all our small groups, if you want to get that on your calendar, and we'll give you more details, hopefully next week. Okay. And Doug doesn't make the platform very awesome, so he must have an announcement, too. Uh, softball. We are starting a fall league this year. Um, since our summer league got canceled. Uh, we are looking at playing starting in a couple weeks, the week of the 15th. I don't have a sign-up sheet yet, but I'll get one out there. Uh, we do have a Facebook um, softball page as well where we'll put the schedule and that kind of stuff on there. So if you're interested, you can talk to me, you can talk to Dan, uh, we'll get you signed up. Thank you. I told him I'd help you laugh. So um, if you're interested in softball, you better sign up. <laughs> All right. Tuesday night, Tuesday night. Uh, they're, they're back in the same night, same place, um, but different time of year, which will, which will be nice. It won't be so hot, probably. Um, the catch with that uh, is that uh, it does start soon, and so when the sign-up list is available, you're going to need to sign up right away. So talk to Doug if there's like a catch. You're not going to be here next week, and it's going to start pretty soon after that. And you're saying, but well, what about practice? Oh, come on. Uh, that'll, be, that'll be Doug's problem, but we don't do a lot of that here anyway. So, um, but we are the defending champions, so don't mess that up. God bless you. Have a great day. <laughs> <laughs>